welcome to our new week. If we go down to our list of things to do, week six doesn't have a fold out because we did our midterm. You can take more practice midterms, there's that link. And then even though we have the link at the top of the page for the Google Drive, then I put it again here because I want to encourage people, especially once we get to finals week, to go down and um, look at all the other midterms your classmates have done. And I haven't even had time to grade all of them. So um, that will be good. You can see how other people did problems and maybe that will help. Okay, we all have a new week of measurement, but first I want to just do other announcements. The first announcement is about the syllabus grading scheme. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the term, when we look at our achievements and what you need to do to get a letter grade, you need to attend study sessions or just check in with me. And some people have been wonderful at that. Thank you. There are even students that just stop by for a minute or two once a week and say, hi, I'm here, no questions. Um, but the purpose of that is to keep everyone from falling behind. It's harder to fall behind if you at least just check in for a few minutes on Sunday night or something like that. But there are students who have fall, fallen behind on um, housing issues, uh, sick relative issues, broken computer issues. So if it is okay with everyone, and we should agree to this because our syllabus is sort of a binding contractual document, then I want to loosen the restriction on this, that you don't have to attend the study sessions each week to get the certain letter grade. I think it has done its job, encouraged people to not fall behind, but I don't want to make it impossible to catch up now. Um, we could either make it that if you have three of a color, that counts also for this, or we could just get rid of the study session requirement ent entirely. Uh, I think the people who have been going to study sessions have been getting stuff out of it. They're getting a intrinsic reward without a pat on the back also. Um, so what do people think? Any ideas? I'm gonna turn off the recording in case you don't want your views saved for posting. Okay, email me if you have feedback about that in a day or two. I might just get rid of this. That's what the people who spoke up talked about. Um, but if there's good reasons to do something else, I want to hear your reasons before we change the contract we've all agreed on. Okay, it's also true that if you use the drop down menu, I've been pretty good about checking off stars for homework, but not very good about other things. And so sit down with me and get all your stars checked off for other things because you've asked questions during class and worked with people and done well on the midterm and things like that. And even the drop down menu, how many study sessions and homeworks you've turned in. That I try and keep that accurate, but not always. It's just one extra place that I'm not as used to to record things. So I'll holler if I need to give you more credits for things here. Okay, second, um, there are those classmates I just mentioned that want to catch up. Some of them have started turning in homeworks. Some of them have a computer that works now. Um, do you want to schedule a new weekly study session that is specifically for catching up? No current homework allowed. And if so, when would that be? So I'm going to do a poll. And do, do, do. Launch. There we go. So does everyone see my poll? It's just the days of the week. If you are not interested in this, don't answer the poll. This is just for the people that either want to be catching up or are willing to be there, even though they're caught up to help their classmates. Sometimes it's nice to explain things to someone else to make sure you understand it. Okay, I'm seeing just one answer of Wednesday. So I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, 
I'll send out something in the after class email about that and we'll see what happens. Okay, um, third, some of the midterm problems were really hard, especially the one about the car, number 42. The one about the percentage of a mile, number 43. And the one about the post dated check, number 44. So I wanted to share why I put really hard problems on the midterm, because there's three reasons. One is that there will otherwise be students that do worse on the final because they get stuck on a problem in the middle of the test and refuse to skip it. They want to just let you know that some problems are annoyingly hard and it's okay if you just skip one. If we go back to that grading scheme, then no one needs to get more than 85% on the final. So if we say, what is, maybe there's 35 problems on the final. So 35 times 0.8, right? you can turn in 28 of the 35 problems and get an A in the class. Everyone is allowed to skip some problems. So one reason to give you hard problems now is to train you that it's okay if you skip a problem. That's not the end of the world. If something is taking too much time, it's tiring out your brain too much, then you don't have to do that one. Um, when you're making your nice step-by-step -step answers last week after the fact, it's good if you do answer everything. That gives you more options of what to study for on the week 10. But um, one reason why to not worry about doing all the problems is to just get that in your head. And I'm sorry if that's mean, but it's better than people doing poorly on the actual final. Another reason is also just mean that I haven't taught Math 52 before, and I'm wondering how much Math 20 stuff you know. And if I gave you only easy problems that built off your Math 20 foundations, I wouldn't know that. So let's give you something a little more challenging and see if you handle it. So that I partly need your feedback for. Is this something that you can do only because you're um, copying someone else's answers, or is this something you and your group were able to actually figure out? And then the third reason is to give you more to talk about. So I'll go into that a little bit more when I talk about this problem and offer to do 43 or 44 today. But when I'm explaining something, the problems often have multiple parts. This one, for example, has a part where I drew a picture and the part where we did a percent sentence. And when you work with other people, our brains will play this terrible trick on us. So say that Maria explained this part to me with the picture, then my brain is going to say, oh yeah, whatever Maria says is going to be about this picture. That's Maria's part of the answer. And if she tries to tell me more, she's at a disadvantage. Right? If Journey tries to explain this side, then my brain is sort of all ready to hear that. But if Maria kept going, my brain is going to try and squeeze it into this other thing that she already explained. Does that make sense? So if I have problems with more steps, that encourages you to talk about things more. And that's realistic. On the job, when people are sitting around a big table trying to figure out what to do with this decision, it's often a multiple step issue. And so to have some experience in class when there's no money on the line, about, yes, I can explain this part, and then for some reason it's harder for people to understand me, or I am listening, and it really helped, helped to have one person explain part A and one person explain part B, then that's something I want you to experience. That's just part of group work in math. Okay, number four, other than those three problems, is there, are there any midterm things that we should go over today if we have time? I'm also more than happy to just make little two or three minute videos of any midterm problems. If you got them right because you copied someone's answers but didn't actually understand why it's working, now is the time to share that. And we can go over them today if there's time or I'll make little videos. You can put it in private chat to me in Zoom if you don't want to have other people hear that you have questions. Um, but let's make a list. Which other midterm problems do people want to hear explanations about?
none of them. Okay, well, those are the hardest three, but there's probably others that people need. So if you are watching this video at home because you weren't here in class today, then feel free to do this part. Right? Tell me on email, please do this problem as a little video, and then I will be happy to do that. Okay, um, there's minor announcement. I sent you a email a while ago from counseling, just forwarding it about the Making Wise Choices workshop. So they're, they've added another one on November 19th. So I will send an email after class with a new flyer. If you yourself or anyone else you know at LCC is curious about issues of scheduling or grading, then these are the ways to get that answered. Okay, lastly, November is hard, but we're almost done. Um, this is just acknowledging that I understand November is hard and also just a heads up if you happen to be one of the wonderful happy people for whom November isn't hard um, to have patience with your classmates because this is not only Thanksgiving where people are dealing with preparations or making plans or refusing to make plans and your family is upset about it or you do have plans, but we're living in a plague and there's just fewer people sitting around the table than last year and I'm sad and need to deal with that. And it's parent-teacher conference week. I don't know about the other local school districts, but 4J, our kids are home Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, making noise and bothering us, right? And we have to schedule conferences as well as everything else we're doing. Um, so yeah, November is hard. There's a funny, at least to me, and slightly impolite meme about the, this month I'm doing a challenge called November. It's where I try and make it through every day of November. Um, if you don't get the joke, I'm not gonna explain it now, but there we go. Um, the good news is we're almost done. So if we look at our list of chapters from the textbook, then oh boy, we're doing unit six today. And the main thing is this thing called the dimensional analysis what I call a unit analysis. Dimensional analysis is more what the chemists call it. And since our OER book is partly written by chemists, they're using their word for it. After that, we're pretty much done. So chapter seven is just more applications. There's no new math. We're just doing more dimensional analysis and decimal point scoops. 7.3 is a chapter just memorizing some dosage things. But since you have open notes, you don't have to actually memorize them. And then chapter eight has a little bit of new stuff, but not really. It's mostly just jargon. And I have that web page of the angry chemist to talk about chapter eight in a more entertaining way. So it is pretty much true. After we get done with a dimensional analysis within the next hour and 10 minutes, you will be done with new material for this math class. And all the rest is just practice and review and getting your notes together and getting your brain organized and doing well in the final. So that is the good news. Okay, any questions before we do the two or three of the midterm problems? Okay, this one I want to talk about for sure. It is really hard. No one gets this their first time. If you took some practice tests, and oh, that's actually four reasons why. Why was there something hard? The fourth David, reason. David, are you intending to share a screen? Because we're not seeing your screen yet. Oh, you haven't been seeing my screen the entire time? That is absolutely dreadful. Thank you for letting me know. Um, let me kind of recap real quick, share screen. That was terrible. Okay, so there's my announcements. Um, should we adjust the syllabus? Maybe Wednesday for a catch-up study session, four reasons why the midterm is hard, any other problems we wanted, the workshop thing, and November is hard. So here is my joke about November that you didn't see. Right. Do, 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 do. And then here is my picture of our chapters where we are doing this today 
And then all the rest is review or the angry chemist thing, which is just jargon, basically. So I am very sorry I wasn't sharing my screen. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, and I was also pointing here, whoops, pointing over here when I was talking that this was my part A and this was my part B I was talking about earlier when I had Maria and Journey as my example people. But you didn't see that, so that was terrible. Anyway, so number 42 is really hard. No one gets it right. So a fourth reason to put something annoyingly hard on the midterm is that if you did the practice tests, you could actually get this right because you had a heads up on what was happening. And if you didn't, you're not going to get this right because no one gets it right their first time. So an encouraging, encouragement to do the practice finals when we actually get to finals. There might be a problem like this that is not that bad if you've seen it before, but your first time, oh my goodness, no one gets it right. So this problem says a certain car depreciates in value 23% during the first year. So I've shaded in 23% over here. That's how much of the price goes away. That car is worth 11,000 afterwards. So that's the other slice of the pie. That's how much remains of its price after one year. What's the original cost? So I wanted to do this blank is blank percent of blank fill in the blank kind of percent sentence thing that we did so much on week five. The problem is I need two numbers that match. I need a percent and a part that goes with the whole we're looking for. And my percent was with one wedge of pie and my amount was with the other wedge of the pie. They don't go together. So I can't put in a 23 and an 11,000 here. I need two numbers that fit the same wedge of the pie. And I can't find the dollar amount for the blue slice. I don't know what that is. I don't know the dollar amount of the depreciation. But I can find the percentage of what remains. That would be 100% minus 23 is 77. And now I can say, I don't care anymore about this 23. Its only purpose was to get me the 77. And I can put in 11,000 is 77% of what bigger number? Because I have two numbers that go with the same pie slice. Any questions about that? Okay, now 43 or 44, we could do one or both of those. Anyone want to spend some time in class doing those? I'd like to see number 44 again. <laughs> okay. We're otherwise quiet. If no one said anything, I would do 44 anyway. Okay, I'm willing to trust you that we can save 43. Let me know if it should be a video. Get a little bit of that. 44, I'm not going to skip. Okay, first of all, I want everyone to be patient. <coughs> not everyone knows what a payday loan is these days, so I want to explain that. So a payday loan is where I go to a certain kind of business and get a loan for just a few days. Maybe my water heater broke, I need to fix it, but I don't have enough money in the bank right now. So I will get a short-term kind of high interest loan because I probably don't have a good credit history since I have no savings, um, just so I can pay for whatever, my car repairs, my water heater, and then I will pay this company back once I have payday and have my money. The second thing is a post-dated check. So Sterling doesn't want to go back to the store a second time. That would be an annoying chore. So he's going to write a check, but date the check 30 days in the future so that the store can't cash the check and take money out of Sterling's account until 30 days from then. He just writes a date in the future on the top of the check. And then the store just keeps that check in a certain folder. And when the check is finally valid, they can take it to the bank and get their money. Everyone okay with the setup then? Okay, so if you go to the interest section of things, then 
personal finance, simple interest, we get this simple interest formula. If you didn't know where that formula was, then that would be a little trickier, but hopefully in your studying you have found it. If not, you could always just look up simple interest in Google. Maybe some of you got it that way. And we're just multiplying three things. The principal is the loan amount, the interest rate, and how many years. Simple interest is built to work in years. If you have a different version of the formula that says time, it might confuse you because you might put in days or weeks or months, but it only works for years. So we need to find these things. So I'm gonna pick a different color and just list them. So we have the simple interest. Principal rate and years. And some of these we can just look at, like the principal was $967. And the rate, that's what we're trying to solve for. But the others are a little tricky. How do I find how much interest is being charged by the store? What's the income to the store on this transaction? Um, U minus 988.46, uh, right. and then minus 967. Yes, everyone see why? So whatever that is, 988 minus 967, any typos, 2146. I'll learn if my math is wrong because I'm not paying attention to it very much. 988.46, okay. So of that check he writes, 967 of it is just paying back the loan. The store doesn't get anything out of that. It's the 2146 extra, which is sort of what the store earns as profit from this, or at least margin, if you know the difference. Okay, and how about the years? We have 30 days. How do we write 30 days as a fraction of a year. Do we just put 365 divided by 30? Other way, 30 divided by 365. Oh, okay. So if it helps you, some people like thinking of it as a fraction. But since I'm going to put it in the calculator, then I'm going to write this as a, as a division. Because remember, fraction bar just means division. Everyone okay with my setup now? So we haven't gone over plugging things into formulas a lot because we don't need to, but in general, if there's a formula that's new to you or complicated, then this is the safe way to do it. List out everything in the formula, figure out what each thing is equal to, because once you plug it in, it's easy. This is where the hard math happens. This is where things are tricky. Okay, now we just plug it in. So our interest is the 21, 46, and that's the principal times the rate times the 30 divided by 365. This is like the hardest algebra gets in math 20. So if you haven't seen this before, don't feel bad. I'm first going to take advantage of the fact that I can multiply things in any order. So I'm just gonna switch these two. Right, two times three is the same as three times two or so on like that.
Okay, everyone with me so far? Now, all of this business is a number. So I'm going to take all of this business here and make it into one number. So what is that? 967 times 30 divided by 365. And I get about 79.48. And since I just rounded, I'm going to put an about equal sign in that step to say that's the step where I did some rounding. Okay, now this finally looks familiar. Number equals something I don't know times another number. How do I finish up? Um, you would divide. Yeah, divide both sides by that. If your number is slightly different because you rounded differently than me, that's okay. So my rate is 2146 divided by the answer and I get 0.27, so 27%. Questions about that now that you've seen it? So first of all, there was a formula we didn't talk a lot about before. So that made it tricky. Secondly, there were two places where what we were plugging in needed some fiddling before we plugged it in. So that was tricky. And lastly, the thing we're solving for was in the middle instead of at one edge. So we had to fuss a little bit to make it look like we're used to. So that was tricky. Okay, any other questions? Everyone ready to do one of these themselves if they had to later? So on to our new topic. Um, week four, we had a slide, hopefully this is big enough to be legible, where we did the same problem. A bug crawls 36 feet in 1.8 minutes. How many feet would it crawl in 12 minutes? We did that in three different ways. We could find an intermediate rate, what is the feet per minute, and then multiply it by 12, because there were 12 minutes. We could do a proportion, one situation on one side, another situation on the other, an equal sign in the middle. 36 feet goes with 1.8 minutes. Stop right there, put feet on top and minutes on the bottom so they'll match. Then I keep reading how many feet would it go in 12 minutes? And then we cross multiply and get the answer. And then just as a foreshadow of what's happening today, I also mentioned a process called unit analysis, where we took the thing that was given to us about this specific situation, in this case that it's 12 minutes long, wrote it as a fraction, put it over one if we needed to. And then we wanted to cancel out words where we got rid of minutes and turned it into feet. And then we did fraction multiplication. So multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and then do top divided by bottom to get the answer. Does that ring a bell? It's been three weeks. So this might be way faded away from your brain. Sort of somewhat blank stares. Okay, so the reason I'm showing this unit to you now is first that if it helps you, because we've seen it a tiny bit, maybe, but mostly I want to contrast this one where we have an equal sign in the middle with this one where we have multiplication initially and we only get our equal sign at the end. Since they both involve fractions, and they both involve an equal sign, there is a temptation with what we are doing today to try and cross multiply here. 
but this is not a proportion. We're multiplying fractions. So we go across the top and across the bottom. Don't get this proportion confused with this multiplication. Everyone okay with that heads up warning? Okay, now we'll actually go into our stuff. So we're talking about units of measurement and this thing called the unit analysis or what the chemists call dimensional analysis is our main thing. I have a cute write up about units and their history where we get inches and feet and yards and everything from. You can read this on your own. If we were in math 20, I would go slow and read it to you. But since we only have a little more than an hour a week, you can read it yourself. A thing that might be useful at the very bottom of this is this picture about, oops. how much of liquid measurements are together. So the whole thing is a gallon. There's four quarts in a gallon, because a quart means there's four of them, like quarters and a dollar. Each quart, we could break up into two pints. And each pint, we can break up into two cups. And if you shop at the grocery store, cups are these little tiny milk cartons like you get in elementary school. Pints are the cartons that are the same size, but twice as tall, like you might have creamer or heavy cream in. And then quartz, of course, are bigger than that. They're usually much you know, fatter, four times as fat. So anyway, read through this thing about measurement history on your own. That's not what we'll do today. There's also one-step conversions. And that's just using proportions with measurement issues. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first I wanna keep going with the unit analysis. Okay, well actually I'm gonna do with the goes with chains. Goes with chains are fake. There is nothing about this that other people talk about. It is just something that I use to help get your intuition right now. This is the wrong way to do this problem, but it will help you understand the right way in a moment. Okay, is this big enough for everyone to read? So Lucy drove from Eugene to Los Angeles. We're told a bunch of rates. On average, she drives seven hours per day, 60 miles an hour. Gasoline costs $3 a gallon and her car gets 20 miles per gallon. And the question is how much did she spend each day on gasoline? We're trying to take these four rates and somehow push them around to get a new rate of one day goes with how many dollars? Everyone understand the problem? So this has too many things going on. It's not going to fit like a proportion. It's not just one situation and another situation. So we need some different tools. So I'm just gonna start by saying one day, that's where we're starting, is seven hours. And now we've used up this rate. I wanna keep going. I'm gonna actually move this over. Okay. So what else uses hours with my three rates?
The 60 miles per hour. Yeah. But what I have is seven hours. So I have to kind of massage this to make it work. I'm going to do a times seven top and bottom. And that says seven times 60 is going to be 420 miles in seven hours. Everyone okay so far? And now I'm done with that rate. I've used it. Okay, I want to keep going. What rate do I use next? The three dollars per gallon. I don't have dollars or gallons here, so I can't build off that yet. So read the last one then? The last one, the 20 miles. That's the other one with miles in it. But I don't have 20 miles, I have 420 miles. So again, I have to fudge things a little. Let's do a times 21 top and bottom. And that gives me 420 miles. And that goes with 21 gallons. And now we're done with this rate. We've used it. If we tried using it again, it would go backwards, right? It would bring us back towards miles. Okay, only one left. Three dollars in gallons. What do I have to multiply top and bottom by? <clears throat> 21. 21. I have a 21 gallon in the middle of the page, so I need a 21 gallon over here also. And if I do it to the bottom, I, to be fair, I have to do it to the top. Okay, everyone okay with my chain? So this is my jargon, I call it a goes with chain because one day goes with seven hours, seven hours goes with 420 miles, 420 miles goes with 21 gallons and 21 gallons goes with $63. But this was really annoying. We had to keep unreducing these fractions. And if you do more of them, if you go to the part of the website here and see that there's more of them, I have very carefully arranged them so the numbers work out okay. If you pick other numbers, this is an absolute nightmare because the numbers don't work out well here. So we need a better system. We don't want to have to keep making things step by step go with each other because that's not going to work most of the time. So we now have a totally different process called unit analysis. This is the better version of what we just did. And it has four, not four steps, five steps that won't make any sense if I just read them out. So I'm just going to do a problem for you. First, I'm going to do a really easy problem. How many inches is 3.7 feet? So the first step says write the thing as a fraction. So I will do that. 3.7 feet is not a fraction. How do I take a normal number and make it a fraction?
He did it over here. You could put it over one. Over one. Then next step, these two go together. I'm going to start multiplying by some things. I want to get out of feet and into inches. Do I know how to go from feet to inches? Yes, I know how to go from feet to inches. Now, why did I put feet on the bottom and inches on the top? Could I have done it the other way? And the answer is no. I want these words to cancel out. So I want it to be that feet cancels out with feet. So just like when I cancel numbers when multiplying, one has to be on top and the other on the bottom. So how do I get from feet to inches or inches to feet? Well, there's 12 inches in a foot. I want inches and I got to inches. So hooray, mission accomplished. Next, I'm going to multiply. So up top, I have 3.7 times 12 and inches is still around as a word. On the bottom, I have one times one, and the word feet is gone. So whatever 3.7 times 12 is. Then 44.4. I probably shouldn't write over one, but the last step officially is simplify the answer. So if you need to, go top divided by bottom, and that turns any fraction into a decimal. And you might be thinking, well, this is stupid. I could just multiply 3.7 times 12 without writing all of this. And yes, that is true. But I wanted to go through these five steps with something that was very, very simple so that you could see them in action before we do a harder one. And also notice if I'm just having a miserable day and my brain is off and I'm thinking about some other issue and so on, this is pretty much foolproof. I might mess up and divide by 12 if I was just trying to wing it and do it all in my head. But because I have this process, I'm not really making any choices. I'm writing my thing over one. I have to put feet on the bottom, so it will cancel. I do my fraction multiplying top and bottom, and the calculator does that. And then I do top divided by bottom to get an answer. So this is great. This is kind of foolproof. It's new, so it might seem confusing and long, but once you get used to it, then this is a very reliable way to always get the answer right. Okay, ready for a harder one? Okay. Do, 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 do. So the lizard, who is asleep very much on his cage right, right now, um, let's pretend that once I timed him and he is moving at 200 inches a minute. I am not used to thinking of speeds in inches per minute. I want to think about miles per hour, right? If I'm jogging or biking or driving, that's how I think of speeds. So can we change 200 inches per minute into miles per hour? One thing you might want to know is that one mile is 5,280 feet. If you were in math 20, you'd have to memorize that. You can just put it in your notes. But most people have at the tip of their tongue that there's 60 minutes in an hour, 
24 hours in a day and things like that. But the one that not everyone has memorized is that a mile is 5,280 feet. Okay, are we ready to start? So step one, write the thing as a fraction. So 200 inches per one minute. Remember that per means fraction bar. Per means division, 200 inches per minute. Okay, we've done step one. Now I want to write some empty rates. So I want to get out of inches. And since inches starts on top, I'm going to put this other inches on the bottom. Do I know how to go from inches into miles right away? No, I don't have that memorized. Maybe you do, but I don't. What can I go into? Go to feet first. I can go into feet. Yeah, my inches have canceled out and I'm going into feet. Great. Now I need to keep going. I want to get out of feet. Can I go from feet into miles? Yes, that's the fact up here that we just mentioned. So, okay, now I will say we're going out of feet and into miles. Well, I'm actually going to write things in now. That one foot is 12 inches and one mile is 5,280. So these two steps are separated just because sometimes we do what I did. I'm not going to bother to write the numbers in until I make sure that my plan works. I'm getting miles. That's what I want. But right now I have miles per minute, and that's not what I want. I want miles per hour. So I need to keep going. Where am I going to put my new copy of minutes? On the top or on the bottom? Rick is pointing to the top. It is minutes so that it will cancel out with that minutes. Can I go directly from minutes to hours? Do I know that one? Sure, I know that one. There's 60 minutes in an hour. Now I have miles per hour. That's what I want. I am done with all of this garbage. So notice again, I never really have made any choices yet. I wrote something as a fraction. I set up these conversion factors. I just took things out of memory or out of my notes. I had no choices about where things went because inches on top forced inches on bottom and so on. So, so far we're pretty foolproof. Okay, now we're going to multiply. So up top, we have 200 times 1 times 1 times 60. So 12,000. And miles is what's left. And on the bottom, we have 1 times 12 times 5,280 times 1. So 63,360. That wasn't bad, the calculator did all the work. And as my last step, I'm going to do top divided by bottom. Almost always rounding here. So I want the 12,000 divided by previous answer. And they get about 0.19 miles per hour. My lizard is not a speedy lizard. Okay, questions about any of that?
That's the hardest it gets. So it's like riding a bike. It's a long process. You're not used to it if you haven't done this before in any of your math or science classes, but it's a reliable process. It's the same every time you do it. You're just building on rates until you get the units you want. Multiply across top and bottom and the calculator does all the work. Top divided by bottom gets you an answer and you're done. Oh, okay, let's do another one. By the way, those two examples are here on the web page step by step because they are that important. Um, how many pints is 11 gallons? So we can go back to this thing. One gallon is how many pints? Let's just eight, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Everyone see that now? Okay, so oops, wrong. So what are my steps? I'm gonna say 11 gallons. It's not a fraction, so put it over one. I go from gallons to pints or eight pints are in a gallon, and I get 88 pints because my gallons cancel out. It's normally that fast and easy and reliable. Only when your teacher is mean do you get these giant problems like you just saw. This is what we call a one-step conversion because I know the conversion rate to go all the way from start to finish. The one-step conversions I can also do as a proportion. I can say 11 gallons is how many pints when one gallon is eight pints or something like that. On one side, you have this situation. And on the other side, you have the conversion rate that's always true. You can also do this as a unit rate problem. If you think about it that way, then times eight just might make sense to you in your head then. The tricky part about if you think about it with unit rates is you tend to do a little bit more in your head. So if you're tired or worn out, you make more careless mistakes. The reason we have the proportion and unit analysis ones is that if you set things up correctly, if you have things cancel correctly or be parallel in your proportion, then you don't make mistakes. Could you show the um, graphic with the gallons and pints and other things? Yes. That one. Thank you. You're welcome. I can write the rest of the things while we're looking at it. So it's going to be four quarts, eight pints, or 16 cups. Okay, let's look at things 
in our fold out again. So measurements and their history, go over that on your own reading. One step conversions we just talked about. All you have to do is either use a proportion or unit analysis, they're quick and easy. The goes with chains, don't look at that more. That again was just a temporary way of thinking how rates smash together to help you understand the unit analysis. The last thing we wanna do for the next 10 minutes is more about the SI prefixes. So I know that we'll get back to that. 6.6 uh, .6 is about memorizing pharmaceutical things. So knowing we haven't done this yet, let me get to there, but then bring up our textbook. So you believe me that we're on track for things. So instead share that. So looking at our textbook, then let's jump to page 183. and see what's happening. So they are talking here about different types of measurement things, including the gallons, quarts, pints, and cups that people often don't have memorized if you don't do enough baking. Then they talk about dimensional analysis. So you can see their picture of what we just did. Make these chains of multiplication where things cross out. They go over this with lots of different example problems. None of theirs are as long and complicated as ours, maybe example 6.6, .6, but there we go. They don't give you enough homework, by the way. This is a week where you will want to go on the old part of the website and do more random problems because they just are very skimpy on homework here for some reason. Then we talk about the metric system, which we're about to do, and converting between things in the metric system, which we're about to do. Again, kind of skimpy homework. And then they're going back to unit analysis. If you're mixing up the American system and the metric system, then unit analysis or proportions are the way to go. And then here's the, let's memorize things for medical abbreviations, so. Okay, ready to go back to the website? Okay, I will close that. Go back to share things. Okay, so SI prefixes. Americans are lazy, and then not only do we not use the metric system, but we call it the metric system. The official name is the SI system international, but we are lazy and call it the metric system. So if you read through that history lecture, you will see that a kilogram is a thousand grams, a milliliter is a thousandth of a liter, a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, and a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. Hopefully that's not completely new news to anybody. You've used the metric system at least a little bit. If you grew up with the metric system, great, you have a big advantage here. So the general prefixes we care about are these ones. Kilo means times a thousand. The plane unit, which is going to be either a gram or a liter or a uh, meter. Centa means divide it by a hundred, milla means divide it by a thousand, and micro means divide it by a million. Cents, you can remember a hundred cents in a dollar. Cent it means one hundredth. And milla is like the word millennium. There's a thousand years in a millennium. If that helps you. In general, the prefixes have this pattern. This 
there are some prefixes that even if you travel in Europe, you will almost never use. Everyone uses the plain unit, the gram, the liter, or the meter. Almost no one uses deci, and almost no one uses deca or hecto. But you can see there is the pattern. We start at times one, and we divide by 10 or 100 or 1,000, or we multiply by 10, 100, or 1,000. For some odd historical reason, there's no names for divided by 10,000 or divided by 100,000. But if you divide by a million, that's micro, which is common mostly with medical applications, micrograms of medicine, a millionth of a gram of medicine. You can apply these prefixes to other things. Right? Our electric bills have kilowatt hours, but we're not going to worry about watts. So this is your prefix list. Hopefully this is review. You've seen it before sometime in your life. but. If not, I'm sorry, I'm going kind of fast. Questions so far before we get to doing math with it? Okay, so why does the rest of the world make fun of Americans? Because you don't actually need to remember all the stuff that I just put on that slide. All you have to do is in your notes, put this list, KHD, the plane unit, DCM dot dot micro. It's just the initials from here. The most common acronym people are taught to remember this, if you did want to memorize it, is King Henry does usually drink chocolate milk, but that's a terrible acronym because does usually and usually does, you can swip, swap them in English and it makes as much sense. So the one I like is Killer Hobos Dance Under Dazzling Crystal Mobiles. If you have another one, let me know, and I will add it to the website, and it will be immortalized forever. So we have this shortcut where if you have to do scoots to do a measurement unit conversion, whatever you do on this list of letters, is the same thing as to get your answer. So if the problem was 3.6 meters is how many kilometers, then I'm starting at my plane unit of meters and I'm going one, two, three to the left to get to kilo. Everyone with me so far? So I do that down here, one, two, three, and I get 0 0.0036 kilometers, and I'm done. Could I do this with a proportion? Sure, I could set up 3.6 meters is how many kilometers, knowing that one thousand meters makes one kilometer. Could I do this with unit analysis? Sure, I could say 3.6 meters, put it over one, multiply it by meters on the bottom so they'll cancel. 1,000 meters is one kilometer. Multiply across, top divided by bottom. I could do it these other ways, but that's work. This is just scooting on the page. Let's do another one. Let's say um, 0 0.02 kilograms is how many milligrams. So where am I starting this time? The start or kilograms? I'm starting on kilo way over here. My unit is grams this time. I'm starting at kilo. I want to go to milla. So one, two, three, four, five, six to the right. 
gets me where I want to go. So I do that here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So two with four zeros after it. I'm not. So as long as we're staying in the SI system, staying in the metric system, measurement conversions are really easy. Pick where you're starting on the list, find where you're ending on the list, and then whatever scoots you have to do in whichever direction, do that with your numbers. If you're not stuck in the metric system, in the SI system, if you're leaving it, or if you are going into it from American system, or if you're just staying in the American system, then you have to do something else. You have to make a proportion or use unit analysis or something like that. Okay, I want to go back to the book then. So in 6.4, they're talking about this. They list out the prefixes. For some reason, the book really cares about all of them. I don't know why. Deca, hecto, desa, you're never going to see these. But the book cares about them, so they give you too much attention to them. They give you this long table, which you don't really need. And then they talk about on the other side, this thing that actually is more useful, where we're just going to use scoops, like I showed you. Then they have a few problems. These should be really fast. All you're doing is scooting. And then they say, by the way, it's not always so friendly. If you're mixing up American and SI units, then you'll have to use a real process. Okay, we are mostly done again with all the new stuff for Math 52. We're going to practice unit analysis in a gazillion different ways this week and next week. It happens all the time. It's like most of first year chemistry is just more and more unit analysis as well as how to shake a beaker so it doesn't splash on you. And we have a little bit with decimal scoops and how they fit with logarithms and the pH scale. But we're pretty much done with new stuff. So what this means is help each other get caught up, make sure you are caught up. Hopefully you already are caught up. That was the whole purpose with last week with that terrible midterm and making your notes picture perfect that you are now able to start November feeling like you are happy with your math class. Uh, but if that's not you, then you still have some time. We're not going to be dumping lots of new stuff on you anymore. Keep practicing. Let me just share my screen once more. So again, the homework is skimpy this week. So at the end of each section, then they give you not only the 10 exercises, but these random exercises. So those might be good ones to do, right? Reload the page, get new ones, try them again. If you need more practice than the textbook gives you, then these random exercises will be your friends. These are exactly the same problems as I use on my finals. So okay, I'm going to stop recording a few minutes early, I think. Okay, so Rick wants me to do this problem with Lucy's drive again, but the right way with unit analysis to see how much easier it is. I am happy to do that. That's actually one of your homework problems, but I will be nice and do it for you early. Okay, so we are starting with 
um, one day. So you're not, sure, you're not sharing the screen. I'm not sharing the screen again. Arg. Okay, so we're starting with one day. And that's not a fraction yet. So we put it over one. So what rate will I use to get out of days? Only one of these has days in it. Seven hours. Yeah. Is it okay that I'm putting hours on top and days on the bottom? Yes, because days will cancel. Okay, I'm still not to dollars. I'm wondering how much money she spends. So I have to keep going. What's the next one I use? The other one with hours on the bottom, so 60 miles over one hour, so it cancels. Okay, and this will cancel also. As a side note, Notice when I write my cancels, then some of them go this way, some of them are doubles, some of them go the other way. That's so later on when I'm looking back at my work three weeks from now, I can see what I'm doing. You don't have to do that. I am extra special, but you can be extra special too. Okay, we're still not to dollars. So I want to get out of miles. How do I do that? Use the um, 20 miles or one gallon. Yeah, 20 miles fits with one gallon. And I'm almost done. One gallon will cancel with $3. Now multiply across the top, seven times 60 times three gives me 1,260. And on the bottom, that's just a 20. So that divided by 20 gives me 63. I never had to do anything with these rates. Last time we had to do times 21s and a bunch of baloney to make them match. I don't care. It's all coming out right here and here with multiply across the top and bottom and then top divided by bottom. So much more friendly. Why does this work, by the way? Let's go back to this one. I can't just take 200 and divide it by 12. That changes it. Why am I allowed to do this? How does one foot and 12 inches compare? Actually, equal when you take the other side. Yeah. You're multiplying times one, actually. Any fraction that's the same on the top and the bottom is equal to one. So all of this is just times one, three different times. It doesn't look like it, but it is because these fractions are the same thing on the top and bottom, just written in discomies. It's not quite as obvious in this problem with Lucy's driving, because we don't tend to think of seven hours as a day. But for her driving, it is. So these are also times one. So could I ask, did we actually need that first step of one day over one? Because the fact that you canceled out days, the answer we're looking for is how much did she spend per day or each day? Don't we want to have per day in the final? I use answer? it because it's part of the question here. Right? This question that they ask starts with days and it moves to how much did she spend? It moves to dollars. So my habit is to always start unit analysis with the thing they give us in the question. 
So it doesn't, if in this case, the each day means a one, but it might not have been a one. So then the number would actually matter. So the same thing with here, when the question asked about 3.7 feet, then I start with my 3.7 feet. So I'm just following that habit. And I don't, I could leave it out because if it's one, you're right, this doesn't do anything. Okay, okay. so actually the final answer is just $63 that yeah. per day has gone away. Thanks. Yep. If I left, I see what you're saying. If I left this out, then this day would not be crossed out. So there would still be a day here. So there would be a day there and we'd get dollars per day. That would work too. But then you'd have to realize that we're starting with seven hours a day, which isn't necessarily leaping out as why we're starting with it. Right. It's not part you. of the question they asked. So. And it doesn't fit the formula of start by writing a fraction, step one that you gave us in the step-by-step. -step. 